Crossroads Media. Is this guy for real? I mean, is this guy serious? Joel would be! Joel Embiid! We're going to talk about Joel Embiid. If you are new to the channel, though, make sure you hit that subscribe button and hit that thumbs up button as well. I greatly appreciate all of your support. I love you so much. If you're looking to buy tickets for any event, NBA, NHL, NFL, you can use promo code BRODES at SeatGeek's checkout for $20 off. You get hit with those fees at the end. No, you don't. Not if you use the promo code BRODES. You would be foolish not to get yourself to a game. So make sure you do that soon. And lastly, TikTok, Broads Media, at Broads Media. We're having a lot of fun over there. Make sure you toss me a follow on TikTok. And with that, enjoy the show. Just when you thought you didn't have any more to say about Joel Embiid because he already wowed us to death and we were annihilated from human existence because we saw the greatness so many damn times, he pops up with 50 points in 27 minutes. He scores 20 points in the first quarter. He hits you with the one leg dirk. He hits you with the let me dribble the ball up in transition, dribble behind my back, or go to the basket full speed, fall to my right, and kiss it off the glass for two. What are we doing here? That jumper where he's utilizing his body to spin around Jay at around the top of the elbow, and not right inside the elbow, I should say. Free throw line extended. This is ridiculous. This guy makes no fucking sense, and it's amazing, and it's a joy to watch. While Mo Bamba believes it's going to be his night when he drills seven of eight from deep which good for him when Joel goes you ain't gonna do shit in the second half and then that third quarter comes around where the Sixers somehow scored 47 points in the quarter to take away the 10 point deficit going into halftime that is absurd and it all starts because of the big man dictating the pace of play imagine not wanting to play with Joel Embiid imagine being Ben Simmons, the loser that you are, and seeing what a professional athlete is all about. I always date back to, when I watch this guy play right now, I date back to what he looked like at Kansas. Physically, when it comes to just his body structure, and then his game, which we knew there was a ton of potential. But think about how far he has come, how willing and determined he was to get to this point, and so much Sweat and tears goes into it, and now it's really playing out right in front of his eyes. And look, you need to lose to be motivated. You lose to Toronto. You lose to Atlanta, and then go through this Ben Simmons stuff. You know, one thing I have to admit is, I believe that there's something to be said about the growth of Joel Embiid and what we saw Ben Simmons do to this entire fan base and to the NBA world. And that was something that, Joel Embiid specifically used as he bottled it up internally to drive him to take that bigger step. Now, he probably still would have been lethal, still would have been elite, 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 because not winning the MVP trophy probably upset him as well, and that was something else that he used as motivation when he was in the gym and getting better at his craft. But just the fact that Ben Simmons let everyone out to dry, he, he, he left everyone behind him, and basically gave the double bird to every single individual in this city. You don't think Joel goes, <laughs> okay, you <laughs> here we go. Here we go. And it's sensational to watch this guy play. The standing ovation when he goes to the bench. How about the roars when he hit that big time three at the back end of that third quarter for I believe it was his 47th point of the night. (laughs) 27 minutes! 27 minutes! Spare me that the Orlando Magic stink. Because guess what? There's a lot of teams and a lot of players that play the Orlando Magic, and they ain't scoring 50 and 27. They ain't grabbing double-digit push. Oh, by the way, couple bucks, three to be exact, one steal. That's right. That's right. So it was just pure 
unbelievable dominance and it put a huge smile on my face and it's one of those moments where one you never forget it remember when he had 50 against Orlando of course that was insane and then two you know I always when that stuff happens and you appreciate the moment it doesn't matter who the opponent is that's in Insane. Insane. And you know it's insane when someone like Joel, and normally we talk about this in the other way. When he has 28, we have to defend how good 28 is because we're so accustomed to seeing Joel drop 34, 36, 37, 38, right? So when he has 28, he still was very, very efficient and very important and very crucial and very monstrous to the outcome of the game. But we've seen him do so much. This is... Holy shit, we're so used to him dropping 38, 37, 39. The fact that he does 50, it puts it back in the wall. Oh my God, oh man. Right, so it's almost the opposite. It's that overwhelming of, just a reminder, by the way, just a reminder. So it's sort of the opposite light, the opposite direction of it, if that makes sense to anyone. It makes sense to me, but I can understand how maybe that is a little bit of a, Interesting way of thinking about things. Regardless, though, uh, I'm just I'm so proud of what Joel did. I have to flirt in there that Tyrese Maxey had 14 points, and he definitely helped out big time. Tobias was efficient for 8 of 13 for his 21. But at the end of the day, with all due respect to those two individuals, it was the Joel Embiid show in South Philadelphia. It definitely wasn't Drummond, who was missing dunks and the balls hitting the back iron, or Furkan Korkmaz, who's turning the ball over over in his first handful of possessions with the ball in his hands, right? Niang had a couple whoopsie moments out there trying to make a pass. It goes flying into the stand. So you had your problematic issues, and, and that's why the Sixers were in the position that they were to start the game, where Joel, who was efficient as hell, by the way, gives you 20 in the first quarter, and they finish with 25 points as a whole. You couldn't stop the man. Every time he had the basketball, It's either hitting a mid-range J face-up, and that's the scary part about it if you're a defender. What do I do? What do you want me to do when Joel Embiid faces me up? Because he has the ability to drive and get an inch from the basket. I was going to say a foot, but no, uh, an inch, a damn centimeter away from just touching it off the glass or basically putting it in himself. Or he'll jab step me. Or he'll spin around jumper me. Or if you want to send the double team, he'll find his open teammates. What do you want me to do? Yeah, I don't blame you for being nervous. I don't blame you for being scared. I take a charge, personally. I take a charge from a seven-footer. What do you think? Joel, in transition, running full speed, broach. I swear to God, if I look over at the referee and he hits me with the block... Lose my damn mind. Anyway, uh, there's also some other big news that happened. And uh, Philadelphia Inquirer, Keith Pompey, he put out an, a piece about the Sacramento Kings, right? Tobias Harris, Ben Simmons, and then Halliburton healed Barnes and some picks. Let me say this. If you can find a way to get Tobias Harris off your books as well, would I be willing to take back less players in value? Yes, but also then contracts are in play because I don't want to be tied to just random guys for a a window of time, for a significant stretch of time. The reason why I want Tobias Harris off the books is so that money's off the books. But if that money's still on the books with players that aren't very good and not bringing you enough value, well then it's still hindering you on getting that player, getting that star, being able to target somebody else. And that's the name of the game, getting a real legitimate star surrounded by Joel Embiid, not just role players and nice players who are trying to get that star. So if you're moving money, a big-time contract, which is clearly hurting you, for other players that are hurting you as well and limiting you from getting your ultimate goal, which is pairing Joel Embiid up with a serious talent, is it really benefiting you as much as you think. 
The answer to that is no, but obviously it depends. Here's what I'll say. One, the report claims that there's no official offer on the table. So this thing of Daryl Morey saying no is not necessarily true right now because there's no actual offer on the table. Here's what I, what else I'll say is you got to look around to see what else is happening. I've stressed this a bunch of times. This is how the league works. You have one side leaking information, the other side leaking information. The Athletic puts out a piece saying that the Sacramento Kings are not interested in bringing back a Tobias Harris in a Ben Simmons trade. So, one side saying one thing, one side saying another thing. There's leverage trying to be built. Knowing Keith Pompey's ties, is it is it possible that Daryl Morey and the Sixers are trying to leak information to the NBA world saying this is this is what is being discussed and we're not even okay with that to tr- to try and drive up the price? I'm just speculating here. I'm just looking and searching and seeing what this truly means. But but I'm, I'm, I'm knowing that Keith Pompey is part of this society and part of this realm. So you'd imagine that that's where that is coming from. And then the national side of things, maybe Rich Paul, maybe Clutch Sports is involved on the other side of things. Or maybe it's not. Maybe it's just national media in general and Sacramento Kings trying to leak some information. But... You can't sit here and and just read one thing and then automatically say the Sixers are fucking up. The Sixers are screwing up. I can't believe them. Why did they not just take that offer that's there? Well, apparently it's not even their one. And then number two, there's a whole other side claiming that, well, Tobias Harris isn't even a part of what we're trying to bring in. And realistically, if you're the Sacramento Kings, let's be honest with ourselves, why would you try and bring in Tobias Harris? And if you say, well, to get Ben Simmons, I'm willing to take X amount of dollars on here and and build around De'Aaron Fox because that's their message is we want to build around this point guard and around this stud. How does that work with Ben Simmons? He's a fast-paced, up-and-down guy, but with the ball in his hands. De'Aaron Fox, up-and-down guy, fast pace with the ball in his hands. And if you take the ball away from him or if you take the ball away from Ben Simmons, that really does ignore a lot of their strengths and ignore a, a lot of what they do. So uh, it, it's interesting for sure. So that's kind of where I'm at with it. I'm not going to sit here and bang the table and scream, they're idiots, they're morons, they're this, they're that. I, I don't even think that it is legitimately on the table. It is what it is at this point. You're going to have to work in a three-teamer. And that's another thing too is, because people always say, well, Broads, you're very harsh on this trade. What do you want if you're not giving us an answer? With three teams involved and so many moves happening within this one trade, it's so hard to speculate. Well, I want this, that, and this, and that. Well, we don't know because it's going to be coming from so many different parties that it's hard to piece together. If it was a one-for-one, then it would be easy to have your hypotheticals and your conversations. Jalen Brown or Bradley Beal or Damian Lillard, just using those as an example. My ceiling is not that high on Damian Lillard and the Bradley Beals anymore. But the one-on-one makes it easy to have that debate, that barroom conversation, what this player does, what that player does. But that's not what it's going to be. There's going to be 9, 10 moving parts here by the end of it. So to sit here and try and speculate what would make me happy, I don't know until I see it, and it's going to be a lot. A lot of action. So I'm playing the waiting game and just seeing before I spew out my emotions on what they should do, knowing that it's going to be filled with wow and filled with a lot of players picking up their bags and their families and moving to a new city. So with that, you know, that's just where I am right now with the whole situation of the Sacramento Kings, but there's also the conversation happening with the Pistons, and I don't want anything to do with the Pistons and Jeremy Grant and Bay. Even though I like their players for what it is, I don't like them for this specific situation. I don't like it based off of the circumstances to where the Sixers are to bring in that. But I will say that for everyone out there who thinks that there's nothing in Ben Simmons and there's nobody willing to trade for Ben Simmons. No, no, no. There, There is conversation happening. There is conversation happening. There's teams willing to package up their entire team, right? The Detroit Pistons, who are very good, but you get my point that they're picking up the phone saying, I'll give you everything I got. Why is that? Why is that? Yeah. Trust me. Now, does this bleed into the offseason? Maybe. 
Does it happen before the trade deadline? Maybe. My guess is it'll go into the offseason. That's my guess. We'll see what happens, though. I'm not upset with the way things are being handled whatsoever. I do know there's a ton of reaction, though, with Joel Embiid and that 50-point burger, and we got some reaction on the whole trade stuff as well, so I want to make sure I get to that. Sometimes I ramble too long, and we don't get to as many as I would like, so... I think today I did a decent job. I'll say decent. Before we do all that, D. Simone Jewelers, you know that they are my jewelers. I got my fiance's engagement ring from them, and I keep going back. Birthday, holiday, random Tuesday, you name it. Family-owned business located in Haddonfield, New Jersey, previously in Jewelers Row. D. Simone Jewelers, come on. Will, Lou, Nick, and Mike, they will treat you like family. You know that as soon as you walk into the door, your last name has automatically changed to D. Simone. They work with you to get the best design at the most reasonable price you will find in the entire market today. They provide custom jewelry design, jewelry repairs, appraisals, diamond setting, jewelry cleaning, so much more. I actually had a buddy who went to a different spot for his engagement ring. I showed him what I got. I showed him the price that I paid and he went back, returned it, took a hit financially to return it because they didn't give him back all of his money and went to Simones because they hook him up completely with a whole new beautiful, beautiful engagement ring and uh, he said it was the best decision of his life and I'll tell you what, I know for a fact it was the best decision in mine. DeSimoneJewelers.com is their website. If you go into the store and tell them that Broad sent you, they'll hook you up like no other. So DeSimone Jewelers, make sure you check them out. Okay, we'll start with a couple text messages here before we get to the Anytime Hotline specifically. What's up, Broads? I'm a viewer from Wilmington, Delaware. I feel like it's safe to assume that it would be in the Sixers' best interest for Daryl Morey to trade Ben Simmons for a wing defender as opposed to a ball-dominant point guard other than Dame for the fact that we already have a young, promising guard in Tyrese Maxey that has all-star potential written on him. How would you feel about bringing in another point in for Ben that takes away minutes from Maxey? Also, how do you feel about Maxie's potential to be a top 10 guard in coming years? The ceiling is so high for Tyrese Maxey that he's just going to improve, improve, improve. I can see him at an all-star caliber level, no doubt about it. So I'm very excited for who Tyrese Maxey is going to be. In terms of only focusing on one area to bring in, I can't close the door on certain positions. If it so happens, your best return and your best fit with Joel Embiid in terms of bringing back the best talent is a point guard, then so be it. It's a point guard. Right now, you have no, if I'm looking at Tyrese Maxey, you have no options off the bench, right? Yeah, Shake Milton's banged up, but could you imagine a Tyrese Maxey sixth man mode compared to a Shake Milton? Right now, you're running Furkan Korkmaz as your secondary ball handler, and I know Seth Curry can do it once in a blue moon and he can hold the fort down but I'm just saying if you're talking about limiting what you can bring back in return so you don't look at a point guard just because of Maxi, I think that's unfair because Maxi in a six-man role would be electric and be very important to a team in the postseason now you heard Doc Rivers talk about the lack of rebounding which is problematic for sure and needing a playmaker in the playoffs because teams are going to shut you down and then you need someone to have the ability to kind of create their own and win their battles and win their matchups that way. I like Maxi. He can do it at times. He's just very raw, and uh, there's a lot of growing that's going to happen for him. He'll eventually get there. There's no doubt in my mind. I almost guarantee that one day Tyrese Maxi will get there. He's just not there yet, and I'm still willing to look at the point guard position as a whole. I'm not going to uh, pretend that that's not on the table whatsoever just because of Maxi. You can find a way to do both, and with Joel Embiid, if you get a serious ball handler who's even better than Maxi. And you can pair that up and have a two-man game between them? Please. I'm all in for that. Hey, bro. It's Kyle from Connecticut here. Every time I watch Joel Embiid hit that one-legged fadeaway turnaround jumper from 20 feet out, I verbally shout out, Are you fucking kidding me? Because I seriously cannot believe I'm watching a seven-foot center hit these shots on a regular basis. This man is something special and on an absolute incredible run, and I'm so grateful I get to witness it. Not to mention he plays for us, too. Oh, no doubt. If this is happening to to an individual who's not on the Philadelphia 76ers, you admire it from a distance, but 
but it ain't the same way when you're in the trenches for 82 with a huge grin, enjoying every single moment, every single uh, jumper. Now, I will say, when I read out the, are you fucking kidding me, I got to give a shout out to Tom McGinnis on the radio broadcast on 97.5 The Fanatic, not because he throws the F-bombs out there, but what an icon. When you see that and I hear that phrase, are you kidding me? That's exactly what I think and who I think about. So that's clearly telling you the impact that he has made within the 76ers community who has to listen at times on the radio broadcast throughout their lifetime, right? Whenever you're riding around, driving around, and he's on the radio, it's, oh, man, this guy's unbelievable. You know, he's talking to himself for the 48 minutes, A+. plus. But that's exactly, it would be awesome if he could on the broadcast say, are you fucking kidding me when Embiid does one of those? But I'm right there with you, man. I, I feel the same exact way, Kyle. When I'm watching this guy play, I'm in awe with every angle, and he's so versatile. He really is. So I really hope that this puts a a stoppage to all the old school people out there that only want him to play a certain way based off of his side. This is a new era of basketball, and you see how difficult it is when you're on the other side and you're an opponent trying to figure out what is Joel going to do on this possession because I can't stop him because he can be, as he alluded to in the in the, in the the postgame stuff and Maxie and them talking about, you know, Shaq or Dirk. I'm going to be Joel Embiid, and Joel Embiid's a combination of all of them. He's scary as hell, and he's dominant as hell, and this is an enjoyable watch. We talked about it for a long time. This team, it's hard to get into them. It's hard to watch them. It's hard to feel connected to them. We ain't feeling a lack of connection right now. Why? Because Joel Embiid is and should be the favorite for this MVP trophy right now, and somehow it's even better than it was last season, which seems nearly impossible. All right, let's rock with some calls here. Here we go. Monster. Absolutely horrifying fire-breathing monster. If Godzilla was a professional basketball player, he'd be Joel Embiid. What an incredible, dominating performance by Joel Embiid tonight. I knew after that game uh, against the Wizards where he got dunked on by Kuzma that he was going to make whoever the Sixers played next wish that they never existed. They were, he was going to make them wish that they never even touched a basketball. This guy is an absolute machine. And it's incredible how he still, after all these years, seems to be managing to get better and better. Great point, man. Great point. You know what? Taking care of his body, taking care of the mental side of the game, the physical. You know, back in the day, he wouldn't be able to hold his own. Now, he only played 27 minutes tonight. So I'm just talking about more of the big picture approach. But when you would play him, at some point, he'd wear down. At some point, his hands were on his knees because he couldn't keep his breath. And he's sitting there with almost like an oxygen tank he needed, basically, right? His conditioning wasn't there. It takes time for players to fully get it. It takes time for you year after year after year to apply all the knowledge, all the experience into you to get to the ultimate goal. Just keep that in mind in professional sports in general. It is, and I hate to use this word because of what it took, but it is a process and a journey to get there. And by the way, for everyone who didn't like the process, this is why you do it. Now, they failed because Ben is a loser and they missed on faults and this and that. You got Joel Embiid, okay? I'll lose 70 games again and I'll I'll win 10, 12 games to get a special talent like Joel because this, this is the level of players it takes to give yourself the best possibility of making an NBA championship run. Fixing and tweaking the surrounding pieces, yes, that matters as well and it's a difficult task considering one individual is being a bum, but when you have this, this is where it begins. Without this, you're not even in the conversation. You now have this. And that's why before, when he came back from COVID and people wanted him gone, thinking you can't win with this guy, relax, you know, just relax. He had a bad spurt of basketball. He is a human. As much as we say he's, uh, he's, he's a Godzilla and he's, he's a monster and he's this and that, there is part human in him, unfortunately, unfortunately. So hiccups are available at times. And when he fights through that and he gets to this level, it's crazy. You mentioned the Kuzma thing. Thing. That's fascinating. I didn't really put those pieces together here, but yeah, I'm sure that there is some sort of drive involved. Now, I guess the only thing I will counter to that is, and it's not really a, a good counter or a counter in general, but because of Russell Westbrook's dunk that night on Rudy Gobert, I believe that was the same night. 
that overpowered it. And that that was so incredible and so harsh and hard. Uh, I mean, that was, wow, what Russell Westbrook did. All the different angles and the full speed and the slow-mo and the side camera view that the Kuzma dunk didn't get as much flair, didn't get as much pop. And not that that's different for Joel Embiid because he lived that moment out and he jumped up in the air and thought, oh shit, here we go. I'm definitely getting posterized. And he got posterized no matter if the national media was shining attention on it or not. Maybe there's something to it losing a little bit of the pop though because of Russell Westbrook. But yeah, I mean, these people who play at this level, they're wired differently. So I wouldn't be surprised if that did internally fire him up. What's next? After tonight's performance, I, I think it's a no-brainer. I mean, this guy has to be the number one candidate for MVP. He's literally, literally carrying the back on his the team on his back for us to be in uh, playoff contention. And it's just, he just makes no sense. He just, it's just impossible to describe. He's kind of like a Elijah Wan combined with Patrick Ewing. And tonight was just, just amazing to watch. So again, it's just disappointing that we just don't have a second guy. So I mean. Are we expecting that this is the squad going into the playoffs? I mean, is that kind of, or do you think there's going to be any moves made in the trade line? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I do think there's going to be something. I do think they're going to be looking around and seeing what they can bring in. Now, the severity of it, I don't know. You know, if they're bringing in these guys, these veteran and these buyout players and just slapping someone on the bench, clearly that's not going to move the needle for a lot of people. And then because of the drama that's happening, to make a move that's more than that and more of a a move that, you know, your traditional trade deadline would be, not so much a big star, but like a, a, a nice player to help you fit your roster out better, that's going to be difficult to do as well because of the drama that you are surrounded with now and some of these pieces that you might have to put into a deal with Ben Simmons, whether it's a Matisse Thibel or someone along that lines, it makes it very, very iffy if you're Daryl Morey. So I honestly, I'm just going to be 100% with everyone and 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 a thousand percent honest. I don't know. I have no idea what to expect. I won't sit here and pretend and say, well, I mean, this and that. Right now, right now, I have no idea their approach at the trade deadline other than trying to trade Ben Simmons. Secondary layers? Just moves to help out the bench? How do you? When your focus and your emphasis is on one guy, and then who would you trade for that when some of these players might need to be involved? And, so, and you wouldn't just trade a Matisse Thibel for another bench player at the trade deadline because that isn't really improving you the way that you're trying to make the improvement with. It would be adding players to your Matisse Thibels and your bench players and things of that nature. So, you know, I don't know. I have no idea what they're going to do as a whole there. Uh, what else did you mention that I, I wanted to touch on before that? You talked about... Ah, fuck. Oh, I remember. All right, so the MVP, right? If Giannis is taking off the Bucks, and if Steph Curry is taking off the Warriors, although the Warriors, they do have Klay Thompson back and whatnot, they clearly take hits. Both of those teams take hits, but they're still a very good team. If you take away, and I'm not saying NBA championship caliber worthy because as I alluded to earlier, you need that level of star to put you over the hump to even have dialogue about winning a championship. But ultimately, my point still stands, which is you take Joel Embiid off of the Sixers right now. I don't even know if they're better than the Orlando Magic. I don't even know if they're better than some of these teams that are trying to lose on purpose. They might be process 76ers. Who's even dribbling the ball up the floor? Right now, they don't even have any guards. Well, they do. Tyrese Maxey came back. They do have a guard right now. But ultimately, come on now. You take and beat off the damn floor, and this is a different This is a different team by a large, 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 large margin. Most valuable player. This thing, sometimes it gets skewed, and sometimes it gets flawed on who had the best season. Is it the most valuable player, or is it who had the best season? And sometimes, maybe that's not the same thing, even though you think it would be. He's clearly the most valuable player to his team. As you saw in that first quarter. I mean, that first quarter was insane. Here we go. Yeah, what's going on, bro? It's just uh, calling in after watching Joel Embiid just absolutely handle the magic with 50 points in 27 minutes. And uh, I'm just going to say that it's crazy to think 
how lucky we are in our lifetimes to get to watch an athlete like Joel, for him to be drafted here, uh, for him to want to be here, to be a perennial MVP level talent in the league, and for him to be one of the most Philly athletes to ever walk the face of the planet, and just an absolute personality that's a joy to watch. I just can't believe that's just a one in a lifetime individual. And uh, my question to you is, where do you think he ranks right now in terms of all-time Philly athletes for you? And when all is said and done, where is he uh, in, in terms of that list? Because he's got to be on my Mount Rushmore of Philly athletes. I mean, I guess for me, he's still so into it and so raw into this whole thing. When you start comparing him to the Allen Iversons, the Dr. J's, and you really go through the Brian Dawkins, people who have already played their entire career and then some, I don't want the recency bias to dictate where it eventually falls. So right now, I can't put him in that conversation of the ones that have already played through everything and have already live past their respected sport and their respected careers because I just don't think that's fair for me personally. Now, by the end of it, I think there's no doubt about it. He's in the mix and he's there and you talk about your top four, top five guys in this city as a whole, no doubt the trajectory is he is going to fall on that list. But right now, I don't want the recency bias to take away from what I experienced watching Allen Iverson. Me being little, wanting braids in my hair, wanting to wear the the the, the, the tattoos and wanting to have the sweatband, the Allen Iverson. Like, there was a cultural impact of who Allen Iverson was for kids like myself who grew up in the 90s and I was playing basketball all day on my driveway nonstop pretending to be AI. Like, there's so much involved and there's so much into that question that I'll just keep it as simple as whether it's the answer you were looking for or not, and I, I guess it probably isn't, because of him still being active and still being involved, it's the same with Jason Kelsey, to be fair. It's not just an Embiid thing. Jason Kelsey, while there's no doubt he's going to be in that conversation as well, he's still playing, and he's even through it a little bit more. So I feel a little more tied to Jason Kelsey and the top Mount Rushmore at the moment, and we know it's coming towards an end at some point, even though Nick Sirianni's saying he, he sent him some beer to try and convince him to stay a bit longer, which I thought, good touch by Nick Sirianni. Johnny, when you're still playing, I need almost a three-year gap after you're done to see. It's you play your career. I see your career. I give you your time off. All right, let's assess. Let's assess the overall impact on everything. So that's my judgment on it. It's too raw and too emotional right now for me to fully give you that full-on, oh, no doubt he's my number one or number two. But that doesn't mean I'm not embracing every single damn moment of him touching the floor because it's clear if he is in your Mount Rushmore or if he eventually gets there that this is the type of talent that you are very, very, very appreciative to have. And I think we'll end it here with such a good call in terms of just appreciating the greatness of what Joel Embiid is. And with that being said, we're going to shut things down. I want to thank everybody so much for hanging out with me on this episode of Sports Talk with Broads, and I will see you next time.